Welcome back to Clint's Comic Corner Classic Class Non Classic. This episode number 1125 and double shot number 1019. I got one trade from IDW, the other one from Marvel Comics. First up is a Star is from us uh, IDW. It's a Star Trek trade. And so a series that actually started just last year. I got this my dad for Father's Day because he because he's a big Star Trek fan like I am. And he let me read it because he knows it's his, but yeah. Star Trek, Year 5, Book 1, Odyssey's End, Book 1. Yep, this contains the first six issues of this series. Now, the series is basically broken up. Every couple issues is an episode, per se. The first episode is written by Jason Lauren and Colin Kelly, two guys who always work together. Whenever they did comics for DC, half the time they were very forgettable stories. Yep, and they did the first story in here, which I'll get to that one. That's called Odyssey's End, which is the title of the trade. The second story, Communication, Break Down, that's my brand, Easton. The third one, it's called A Truth Artifact, that's written by Jody Hauser. Which, I'll get to this story, this is a weird one. The artwork for the first one is by Stephen Thompson. Really good artist on here. The uh, episode two artist for that one is Martin Carlico, and three is Sylvia Carlifo. Yep. Now, the guys in charge of this are Jackson Leasing, and... Colin Kelly. The first episode is basically the Enterprise of Colin the Tholians. Yep, for the first time since the Tholian web. Yes. Believe it or not, this is sort of a sort of a follow-up to the episode. It's a classic episode from the original series. And it's from the final season of the show. Now, I, I know about third season's reputation, the fact that this is the season they ran out of ideas, and it's a season without Gene Rottenberry in charge. And they and basically what NBC did was to put two idiots in charge. But this is one of the good episodes of season three. The episode where they try to form the Tholing Web. Now they mentioned about the Defiant that's actually brought up in episode two. Yeah, where it was kind of taken out by the Tholians. Though here's kind of the strange thing when it comes to the Defiant. It was later retconned in an episode of Enterprise that the Tholians who appeared in the episode of Tholing Web. The one who took the find were actually from the Mirror Universe. From the 22nd Century Mirror Universe. And they took it from the Century of the Future. Yeah. So if you wonder what happens to the find, watch in the watch the two-parter. Mirror Mirror. Yeah, it's a hilarious episode. And an episode that the people who actually work on the show were just having a lot of fun with because it's a lot of nostalgia for that one. Mm-hmm. And of course, is also referencing here to the arena. Yeah, an episode refer referencing that one. Which, yeah, the arena is known for being one of the most infamous episodes of the series. The one where Captain Kirk fought a Gorn. Yeah, the first episode, the episode was actually really good. <laughs> Up until they showed the Gorn. Like, oh my gosh, I appreciate the CGI version of the Gorn better than the one who appeared in the original series. Because the fight between him and Kirk is so... Lackluster. Even Shatner himself has poked fun of this fight years later. Even he didn't like it at all. But, and here's the thing. They actually brought up the episode in an episode of Deep Space Nine where, where Cisco went asked, like, what was it like fighting a Gorn? And he said encounters with a Gorn too. And says it's three, mind you, because, well, his future wife, her, her brother plays for the Sess 3 baseball team. Yep. So apparently the Tholians attacked this world, which apparently... Now, they mentioned the Tholian Assembly. Now, the Tholians were actually referenced on an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Now, I'm thinking Tholian Assembly. I didn't know what that was. I was like, oh yeah, the Tholians. If you're wondering what the heck the Tholians actually looked like... By the way, this comes from a one episode appearance. They also appeared in the episode in Mirror Dark... In the episode Mirror Mirror... Now, the Tholians look like this. Yeah, and by the way, when they returned for that two-parter, they actually made this CGI. No joke. This is what the Tholians look like. If you watch the original series, this is what the damn things look like. And, though you only saw their face, never saw the whole body, my guess is that the artist probably took inspiration for the body portion. They probably took that from Enterprise. That's probably the reason why it looks like that. 
And so they go after and they take a child bowling. By the way, this child is actually still with them by the most recent issue. And there's a subplot in all the issues that her wasn't teaching anything how to speak English. Hmm? Well, Federation basic. There's some standards. They go, yep. And they kind of, in a way, defeat the Tholians by having them fall into a gravity well. Yeah. But it was a good, it's a good start for the series. The third, second episode is a follow-up to an episode from Season 2 called A Piece of the Action. Yes, it's the episode where Captain Kirk and Spock become gangsters in a planet that's modeled after 1920 Chicago. Yes, I've seen this episode. Yeah, and seeing seeing Shatner put on a Chicago accent is so hilarious. Now, we're going to make the boss of bosses. It's like, see, see? It's so hilarious. But it's a fun episode to watch. Like, a piece of the action for me, anyways. It's one of my personal favorite episodes because it's something different. I appreciate episodes like this where Kirk just takes out his uniform for one episode and puts on a costume. Like, that episode, he dressed up as a gangster. There's an episode where he dressed up as a Nazi. Yeah. I appreciate episodes like this because it's just pure fun. Now, the reason why they came to this planet is actually quite interesting because it's a follow-up to that episode. Yeah, it is. Because it was real at the end of the episode, McCoy left his communicate behind. Which, this... My, my guess is that the writer of the story... Brendan Easton probably told the Trimmers, probably it was probably their idea to do this story. So they go back, and apparently the the planet, the Iconians, that's what they call themselves, they apparently had developed warp drive in the span of about four, they say it's been four years, but this came halfway through season two. So it could have been still in that first year, which is quite... I, I assumed that this episode aired in season one, based on, oh yeah, because this takes place in the final year of the cruise. They also mentioned, they also, I think it was in episode two, one or two, I think it was, where they bring up Carol Marcus and David. And the fact that Kirk can't go see his son on his birthday because his mother does not want him in his life. Yep, and also, Kirk... Is getting a promotion to Admiral, which that's a tie into the movies, which that's cool. I really enjoy that. And they had this wonderful scene of of Kirk and Bone, uh, Kirk and McCoy, in sort of like the ship bar, which the scene itself is very similar to what they showed in Star Trek Beyond. It's a very similar scene. My guess is that. They probably saw that scene because they probably look because it's actually to be honest, it's a great movie of the original of the of the Kelvin movies. That move that that particular movie is the best one of three ones released so far because it feels like an actual Star Trek movie. And they probably probably know that scene. Hey, why would we do that for the original series in the in the original timeline, but doing different context? Which I appreciate that they're actually doing that, and the room looks very similar to the one they showed in the movie. Yeah, it's like very similar. Let's see if we can find. It. I think it may. I think it was the first issue. Yep. Let's see if we can find it here. Yep, here it is. It's almost the same exact room. Like it. It looks like it looks like the same scene. But it looks like it's played in Kirk's quarters. But the Kirk's quarters looks a little different than usual because we've seen Kirk's quarters in the show, and his is like one of like two or three actually shown in the show. And when, when they do the scene, he's actually in his green, ugly green uniform. There's actually a behind-the-scenes reason why Kirk would occasionally put this on. Okay, the article I've read, and Linkari has confirmed this. The reason why that Shatner had to wear this thing occasionally was because the producers were noticing he was putting on weight. And this particular shirt was him poking fun at him putting on weight. And apparently Shatner hated wearing this thing. He had no problem wearing the regular, like, sweater shirt that he's not wearing. As far as I can tell, he's never had a problem with that. He hated the green one. Yeah. Just like how him and the rest of the rest of the series crew hated wearing the uniforms from the, from the first movie. Yep. Now, why in the world they decided to have him wear this for one particular scene? My guess is because, well, it's from the show, so... 
Why not show it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my personal guess of why in the world they decided to do that. Yeah. But yeah, that was the thing establishing whole thing of Carol Marcus. My only guess is the reason why they threw that in, despite the fact Carol Marcus was never established in the show. She was something that was a creation of the movies. So, they probably figured, though, movies are canon, so why not throw in something that was definitely mentioned in the movies that, well, Kirk was never in, well, David, David Marcus' life for good reason, because his mother did not want Kirk in her son's life. Yep. But uh, that happened in episode one, and... Episode 2, like, that one, aside from the fact, like I said, it's follow-up to Piece of the Action, it is by far really good. I, I found this one to be really enjoyable. Like, okay, they go to the planet, and the planet is sort of basically kind of like the way it was back in the 90s. Yeah, thanks to apparently the Iconian studying McCoy's communicator, and apparently learning about the various stuff in the 20th century, which, okay, that's interesting. And so they kind of sped things up, and they kind of like the present. Apparently, the term is only six weeks. So you have a term that lasts for two months? Damn, that's a short term. And you're supposed to be president of the damn planet. Yep. And during the course of the story, Spock gets nominated for being president. And he wins by 80% of the votes. Though he advocates immediately. And what does he do in order to solve their problems? Because they mentioned the whole thing about this is a problem with something caught in it. There's viral factions, one of whom was actually by someone they actually knew from the from the action episode itself. So basically what he did, I thought this was so ingenious for him to do. He basically gave him two books from Earth and one book from Vulcan. Yeah, there's also a subplot involving the Tholian, where <laughs> believe it or not, there's actually one member of the crew who actually doesn't like the Tholian being there. So, they really, and of course they had a brief fight with the, mutant, the people that were trying to kill Scotty over it, but they were basically putting the brig over it. Okay, here are the works they basically Spock gave him. Basically give him a book from Greece, the Republic of the Republic Pluto, Plato, the narration of life of Frederick Douglass, and the teachings of Surak, which I thought that was so cool. The fact that Spock basically gave two books from Earth and one from Vulcan. So basically, okay, they he says, oh yeah, we're going to basically, a triumphant council because of Mark and Coley, who actually is from the episode, and Joe Kirko, basically him and his chief of staff, their names, they reveal in the story, they're actually scrambled letters of Kirk and McCoy. Really cool. Mm -hmm. The last story is... Well, a bit of a lackluster story, even though it's written by Jody Howells, one of my favorite writers. It's just an okay story. It's just the crew getting angry for absolute no reason. And of course, they count to the Cleons, one of whom has this strange metal in his face. Yeah, they don't really explain what the heck that is. I mean, the best thing about this last story is a her and the Tholian, which they call Bright Eyes. And this is a story which. The Tholian starts speaking Federation Basic. Well, Federation Standard. And he's like, what's Federation Standard? It's like, oh, it's English speaking. So, this apparently cures on the madness, basically by the Tholian sort of helping them. And, oh yeah, and the Tholian, by this third episode, apparently the Tholian is moving them with a Hura. Yep, for some reason, moving them with Hura. For some reason, I don't know why. But the Cleons, they just disappear partway through the story. And they're never mentioned again. And of course, everybody's cured of their strange madness where they start fights. Yeah, in case you're wondering, is it that strange creature from the episode Data Dove? Believe it or not, no. That creature doesn't show up here at all. It's not even mentioned. Yeah, it's almost like this, this story was completely pointless. But most people could probably say if they read the story, the best thing about it is a her and the Tholian. Yeah, but this, really good. Can't wait for book two to come out next month. 9.5 out of 10. Damn good book. Alright, next up is a book that I've always wanted to review. Ever since I first heard about this book two years ago. 
Yep, this is Immortal Hulk. Written by Al Ewing and all work by Joe Bennett. This trade collects the first five issues of this series. Though it's a relaunch of Totally Awesome Hulk. And it's part of the same numbering as Incredible Hulk, which is cool. And they even have material from Avengers number 684, which that one's also from Al Ewing with Mark Wade and Jim Zeb. In case you want to the three writers, Al Ewing was actually writing prior to that U.S. Avengers. Jim Zeb was writing Kenny Avengers, and Mark Wade was a writer of the Me Avengers book, which brought back the Hulk. Yeah, how in the world he was brought back? Apparently, the I believe it was the Grand Master brought him back. Some strange mishap, but he was temporarily brought back in Secret War in uh, Secret Empire. But that brief resurrection was never explained in the book. It just oh, the Hulk's alive for one issue and then he dies. Okay, the main story, the thing. Oh yeah, by the way, this cover is done by Alex Ross. Yeah, one of two books is the covers for. The other course being Captain America. And I love these covers. Yes, in case you're wondering about this cover here, that's issue three. And yeah, that does happen. So apparently the Hulk is going up the Gamma Radiation stuff in here. Which I'm like, what, did Al Ewing pull something from Gary Duggan? Like, that was the whole main plot thread of Gary Duggan's run. Was giving rid of all the Gamma Ray, uh, Gamma Ray characters in Marvel Comics. Here, it's kind of the same thing. Mostly you follow a reporter named, let's see, Jackie McGee, who's looking for the Hulk. And the reason why, because apparently he destroyed her, apparently the Hulk destroyed her hometown when she was younger, for some reason. Yep. And she also teams up with the Sasquatch of the Alpha Flight program. He's on leave. Now, apparently, I apparently didn't know this. This by fact being a large time Marvel fan. Apparently Sasquatch was Bruce Banner's roommate. And apparently he has known him for years. The thing is between Sasquatch and the Hulk. Sasquatch is a creation of Chris Claremont. While the Hulk is a creation of the now late Stan Lee and the late Jack Kirby. Yep. And he kind of details Bruce's back when he was in college. Where Bruce is basically the science geek. This is the science guy. And... Walter, basically the Sasquatch, he was the jock, but he was also a scientist as well. And eventually became something like the Hulk, the Sasquatch, though he worked for Alpha Flight. Though, for some reason, Marvel has apparently forgotten there was an Alpha Flight group prior to the Alpha Flight program. The superhero team who operated out of Canada, who basically ran in the direction of Department H. Why in the world are writers that completely forgot about that? No idea. And apparently took a leave of absence because apparently he spent too much time in Sasquatch form. Yep. We also saw the Hulk apparently hurting people but not killing them per se. Yeah, the whole thing of him being mortal, that is actually to the fact that he has a healing factor. And the fact the Hulk cannot die. Yeah, that's the whole reason why the series is called the Mortal Hulk. Because the Hulk cannot die, despite the fact he was killed by Bendis four years ago in Civil War II number three. Yes, he was killed by Bendis. And then one year later, he was brought back by Nick Spencer briefly. And he was brought back again, this time by Al Ewing, Mark Waite, and... Jim Zeb, and of course, they explain anything in something in the main story. Looking off of the flat. Now, they explain a concept I just I kind of forgot about when it comes to issues. There was a thing called the Green Door, which apparently this is where Bruce Banner's late father, David Banner, was kept. Yes, for some reason, despite the fact the guy was apparently dead. He was briefly brought back for Chaos War, but last time I checked, David Banner's supposed to be dead. Of course, they mentioned that. That Bruce Banner's mother died? Yeah, so apparently Al Ewing is keeping some stuff from the Peter David run canon. Yeah, I love the fact he references that big, big flashback for him, which I appreciate that because Peter David's run is fantastic. There's no denying he had one of the best runs on the Hulk. Like, he is by far one of the, t like, in my opinion, Peter David is one of the top five best 
Hulk writers, along with Greg Pak. He's another good one. I would probably say... I can't think of any other one, but those two definitely do come to mind. And Al Ewing definitely is up there. Not like his other books, which actually spread some humor. This one is very serious. Yeah, that's kind of the strange thing about him. And another writer, Chip Sardeski, who's also known for humor in his books. And apparently Marvel keeps canceling them. I'm not kidding about this. Prior to this book, any book Al Ewing was on got canceled really quickly after being around for barely a year. Books like New Avengers, U.S. Avengers, Loki Age of Asgard, Mighty Avengers. His shortest book was Captain America and the Mighty Avengers. We got canceled after nine issues. Yes, apparently Marvel could never allow him to succeed for some reason. And then he was given the Hulk. And this book has been so successful. And it's one of the few titles. Now, this title has got a lot of critical claim and is well earned. This book is basically the first trade to collect the issues run. It's called Orzy Both. Yes, and the critical claim for this book is well earned because it's so damn good and thoroughly enjoyable. It goes back to sort of the horror roots that basically Jack Kirby and Stan Lee took inspiration from when they first created this character. Back in the 60s. As a matter of fact, Al Ewing in the back of the book, he basically mentions in a letter of how much how, how much he loves the Hulk. And, yeah, just like how when Jason Aaron wrote Thor, how he was a big Thor fan, Al Ewing is kind of the same way with the Hulk, where he's a big Hulk fan, and he basically brings in a lot of stuff. Also, and I will bring this up in our trade, he actually does offer an explanation of how the heck Doc Samson came back to life. Because apparently Ben just didn't bother to do it, so have Al Ewing take care of that. I don't know if that happens in the next trade or following one after that, I'm not sure. But this, oh yeah, and also, they actually have it where the Hulk basically sort of fights his father, who is possession of the Sasquatch. Though Sasquatch apparently is yeah, apparently at the Sasquatch is beaten by the Hulk in here. Apparently, Walter can't turn back into Sasquatch for some reason. And also, they mention here about the whole thing of him. Is, they actually, his reaction when Bruce Banner was outed as the Hulk. Yeah. And then the thing ends with Bruce Banner, well, the Hulk looking into like a reflection. And instead of seeing Bruce Banner, he sees his father. Dun, dun, dun. Great ending. Of course, they throw in the end, basically, of how Hulk came back to life, which I do appreciate the fact that Martha in here will explain how Hulk came back to life. Though, in case you're wondering, that was in a storyline called No Surrender, which is a great storyline. I highly recommend people are fans of Avengers because, basically, Al Ewing, Mark Wade, and Jim Zeb basically wrote the story as a big Avengers love letter. Yep. And bringing back to Hulk was a smart decision because I think killing him off was a big among his mistake. Though they kind of though Ben this they kind of wreck how Greg Pak established when it comes to the Hulk when he started his when he re had his second run of the book back in twenty fifteen, though it ended a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great book in this book A, nine point five out of ten. Fantastic book. And can't wait to get my hands a book two, which I'm gonna get soon. Yeah, and here's kind of the strange thing. This book has a connection to Captain America. Yeah, apparently this book on Captain America are loosely tied to each other because of a villain group who apparently does like superheroes and they have vendetta against Captain America and apparently they want to go after the Hulk too for some reason. And get this, one of his members is Thunderbolt Ross and no one else for is apparently part of this group too. Somehow. Yeah, it's maybe a basically corrupt, basically industrialist who hates superheroes. But that's something else for another time. But yeah. This book is fantastic. I highly recommend people fans of the Hulk. And people fans of oh, you just check the book out. It's that damn good. Yep, and Joe Bennett's artwork. I just hope it's artwork. It is so good in here. Like, oh my gosh. Here's basically from the inside cover. Yeah, here's Joe Bay how he draws the Hulk. It looks really good. Yeah, it's a very different look for the Hulk. Yeah, it's it has a similar approach to like the whole like buzz cut. That's similar to the Doc Green look, which I thought that was interesting. They also poke fun of basically Bruce's obsession with purple pants. 
Yeah, they actually have a flashback of why he loves purple pants. Because apparently he sold all of his clothes to Goodwill, and he apparently just bought a bunch of purple pants for some reason. But I like the fact Al going to poke fun of that, because if you notice the Hulk a lot of the time, is not wearing purple pants. A lot of time, for absolute reason, though, at least this book gave a funny explanation. Apparently, Bruce bought a bunch of purple pants for some reason. Yep. Otherwise, that's really it for this particular, because these, these two trades are just so fun to read. I can't wait to read more soon. Okay, so that's it for particular review. I probably won't get time tonight to do part episode two of Race Your Hero. I'll probably see it for tomorrow. And that would be pretty much it for videos tonight, okay? We'll see you next video. Bye.